I just had the best chat with Dr. Kira Lindsay. Kira is a history advocate of South Australia and an award-winning historian. We had the most glorious chat about her latest book, Wild Love. So Wild Love follows Adelaide Ironside, an inspirational Australian artist who is little known, but achieved amazing feats. We talk about Kira's extraordinary research journey uh, with the creation of Wild Love and also writing process, art, it's truly a fascinating conversation. I think you're going to really enjoy it. Hi, Kira. Thank you for joining us today. So I'm just here in the Tom Keneally Centre at the Sydney Mechanical School of Arts and we're on Gadigal land here. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Whereabouts are you? I'm on Ghana country uh, in Adelaide, on the Adelaide Plains. And uh, I love being here too. You know, I wrote most of my book on Gadigal country. Um, but now I'm down here as South Australia's history um, advocate where I champion history in all its forms, whether by experts or enthusiasts as part of um, working at the History Trust of South Australia. So Kerry, you're here to chat to us about Wild Love, your latest book. Yes, I am. <laughs> oh, I'm so well thumbed. I loved it. Um, so I'm really curious to let's start off about before we dive into the book about your writing process. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear about how you write, what kind of inspires you to write, and then also about so you you write from a creative historian point of view, and you write uh, speculative biographies. Can you tell us about this genre? Tell me about <laughs> Yeah, uh, a colleague and friend of mine kind of recently accused me of making up terms that allow me to justify what I do. And I, I think that's kind of playfully true, to be honest. I mean, that's one way of describing it. The other is that I'm, I'm kind of grappling for ways to explain um, the philosophies as well as the processes that I use. And so, you know, having an opportunity to speak with you, Victoria, and the beautiful listeners and people at um, SMSA is a, is a wonderful opportunity to reflect and, and discuss that a little bit further. So, um, you know, I'm trained as a historian. I have a master's and PhD in that space, and I've um, worked in lots of roles as a historian. And one of the things that I, I guess I've come to think about is that sometimes history training can be um, a means towards other ends rather than history being an end unto itself, right? So how can we use our history skills to do a number of other things, which might be to inspire people more broadly about something, to um, as well as to stimulate their curiosity about the past or to build their historical consciousness or just their sheer love of life and themselves, et cetera, et cetera. So I like to think of history not as an end in itself, that I'm obliged to play by all the rules and games of the history, of history, but that I might use my historical methods to become historically conscious and to inspire that in others. So I use the term creative history or in creative his myself as a creative historian because I guess when that debate happened in 2006 around the Secret River by Kate Grenville and Inga Clendenin's, um, you know, very well known um, quarterly essay called Who Owns the Past? And in that, Clendenin um, made the point that history and fiction must sit on the other side of the ravines and never can the two engage with one another because um, they have different moral imperatives and they make different truth claims. Now, I think that there are certainly instances where that is, um, that might be required. You know, there are ethical things associated with some historical acts of representation where we need to be very careful about things. But um, on the whole, for my own practice and what I'm interested in doing, I reject the notion of the ravines. And I, I suggest instead we might think about history and fiction as different acts of representing the past that are more like rivers or streams of water coming into an estuary where the salt water and the fresh water blend. And this creates new fertility where different sorts of projects can emerge. That's beautiful. That's a beautiful description. That's yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Um, obviously there's there's areas that you you really can't go into but like the story of Adelaide Einstein it's just like it connects with the reader I felt so involved I was in that world you know if I maybe have read about her in a more sterile way you know fact here's the facts then maybe I wouldn't have connected quite in the same way you you talk in the book about um 
uh, about writing in kind of a, st- a style like Jane Eyre or something like that. And I do think it kind of just gets your emotions with the story um, and you feel like you're going on a, on a on a journey with Adelaide, which I think it kind of, um, it makes you empathize and sympathize just so much more and kind of put yourself in the positions um, that Adelaide found herself. And then with all the, ama- so many historical uh, kind of uh, little bits that were thrown in there and the connecting bits, it was, um, reading it was just um, uh, a really uh, great opportunity to learn about her life, but then also have all of the immersion of the story as well. So yeah. Definitely. Oh, thank you, Victoria. That- yeah. You know, there couldn't be a more satisfying series of comments to make because that was kind of what I was trying to do. I did want to create a sense of being uh, the reader stepping into her Balmoral boots as she goes out <laughs> yeah. to the and looks for her flowers or yeah. treads the streets of London looking for sister painters or is trying to find her voice, her originality, because I think those themes that were specific to her life, which I picked up from, you know, years of spending time with her archive, they're also themes that are contemporary for us as yeah. individuals and also as women. Yeah. Um, you also asked me to talk a little bit about speculative biography. Yes, so please. Can I riff on that one a little bit yes. too? So I had, um, uh, you know, my first um, book the, was a historical biography set in a very similar time period. Mm-hmm. Um, and in fact, it was about another currency lass or native-born woman called Marianne Gill, who was my great-great-great-aunt. And she um, was born six months after Adelaide but also in Sydney, just a couple of streets away from where Adelaide Ironside was born. But she was born to a Roman Catholic hotelier, ex-convict emancipist family, whereas Adelaide's family, yeah, there are convicts in the family tree there, including the grandmother who was a convict forger, but there was also a First Fleet Marine, which Mm -hmm. gave a different position in society, and they also come from a Presbyterian background. But my interest has always been how do you write the lives of people who would otherwise be silenced or remain very shadowy in the archives? How might might we represent them? So I start from the basis that... um, you know, as the fantastic historian, British historian Carolyn Steedman once said, we can never recreate the past. We will never know what actually happened. Everything that we do is an act of representation. You know, this is what Greg Denning also said, the historian. And so mine is an act of representation. And I prioritise using speculation. So when the archives are so porous mm. and, and, and problematic as iron sites really, truly were, you know, we have a rich archive in some ways when you compare it to other women of her era, much richer than the um, archive associated with the first woman I wrote about, my ancestor. Um, but, you know, cross-hatch letters, letters with no dates, letters with no signatures, letters that left me completely bewildered about how to write this. And so speculation became a technique. Now, what I think is really interesting is that speculation is intrinsic to scientific method. You know, Einstein and many other historic scientists have insisted that without speculation, you cannot make new advances. And yet in historical practice, and, you know, Anne Curtois and John Docker talk about history as being able to be endlessly reinventive because it combines art and science. But in fact, we don't often as historians um, really interrogate the role of speculation in our work beyond putting little caveats and qualifications each time we speculate. What I like about Curtois and Docker is that they said, and this was a definitive moment for me, they said, really, for the historian, narrative is a laboratory and we can test our suppositions. We can test our speculations by seeing how we advance the narrative, i.e., can do I know enough context to take the archive and then make the characters compelling um, for the reader so that they, as Patrick White would say, get up and stand and walk across the page and do what they want to do. And that's kind of what happened for me. So, um, you know, to give a give you a definition of speculative biography. It comes from the work of um, someone, my, my friend and colleague, Donna Lee Bryan, who has defined the term and we produced a book about that um, with many uh, wonderful examples, work and case examples of it. And we define it, or rather Donna defined it as all biographers use speculation. 
but speculative biographers go further. They believe that by engaging with the interiority of a character and trying to get to the sense of their meaning, even by using um, narrative and interiority in different ways, and even first person, that they can get to a greater, deeper truth about the character. Now that is, you know, that's quite um, an assertion to make. That, and I'm not going to swerve away from it because we are pl we are playing with the world of truths. You know, there are historical truths, there are literary truths, and I don't think that it's always helpful for them to be on the other side of the ravine. So in this book, I've tried to bring them together. And you've been very open. The truth. Yeah. You've been very open about that sort of happening. And like um, that, the, it opens a conversation, doesn't it? It allows, um, you know, you to, to gain the things that you've gained from your research and how you write it, but it kind of opens the door to other people to take that journey and other people to start writing around these these kind of historical characters. That's really exciting. Yeah, yeah thanks, Victoria. I think that's right. And, you know, let's be clear that people have been writing speculative biographies for a very, very, very long time. In Virginia Woolf's her um, biography of um, the writer who's in this book, the poet Elizabeth Barrett Browning. You know, she wrote that fabulous book called Flush, which is through the eye of um, Barrett Browning's uh, Cocker Spaniel. That's a speculative biography. And uh, we have many other examples, even in the Australian context, the um, biography about Louisa Lawson. And I think it allows us, um, a, it gives us a, a suite of affordances, right? We can identify yeah. with our characters <laughs> in yeah. ways that traditional biography biographers or historians are often discouraged from you know that there's a kind of proscenium arch that's put in place with much writing which is like you must not relate with your characters well it's like I wouldn't be bothered doing this if I didn't care and yeah. I do care <laughs> yeah definitely definitely and and care to want to get their voices heard and their stories told which is amazing yeah especially um, if their voices are so unique um, um and that is definitely the case with Adelaide Ironside she's yeah. got quite a voice <laughs> absolutely so tell us how did you meet Adelaide how did this how did this story sort of <laughs> come to you like how, how did that all happen well, it's, it, it's a bit wacky but um so I'll, it, it's got a two part to it so the first part is that um after you know like all uh, when I was doing my master's which was on human hobble so this is the sensible story then I'll tell you the other story mm -hmm. I became very interested in um the voices of native born people as they describe themselves so the first Europeans to be born in the Australian context because um, Hamilton Hume was one such person and he managed over time to assert his priority in that exhibition expedition sorry over the British Sterling who um, sea captain William Hobble so I became quite interested in that and also the registers of his voice because he was clearly extremely patriotic and when you look at the archives of the men of that period they're always toasting themselves and their priority as the first born in the country but there's a dark heart to that Victoria which is that by using that term native born as well as distinguishing their rights over the um, over immigrants they're also asserting their rights over the people that they call natives, so First Nation people. And that dark heart, I think, is still sort of alive in contemporary Australian nationalism in some ways. So I wanted to lean more into that, but to ask the question of what a what about the female voices? You know, there were definitely female native-born people. You know, that's why we have a contemporary Australian society. Yeah. And uh, and those women were known as currency lass lasses. They were highly valued within colonial society because they were considered healthier, prettier, more interesting uh, than British migrant women and et cetera, et cetera, who had come to the colony. So I wanted to know more about them. I had one in my own family, which was Marianne Gill, mm -hmm. and um, and that was what the convict's daughter was about, about her life, which uh, revolved around a romantic scandal. And then um, my editor at Alan and Unwin said, so do you think you've got another book in you? And uh, and this is where we move into part two of the story. Mm -hmm. So uh, I went to bed. And I'd been doing this to silver meditation technique to get myself to sleep. And they had this little technique, which is before you go to bed, take a glass of water and say, when I wake up in the morning, 
I will have the answer to this question. So you drink half the glass of water, you put it down and say, my question is, I don't know who to write my next book about. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Is there a book in me? And so I went to sleep, woke up in the morning, and then you have to drink the rest of the water and say, before I put my feet on the ground, I'll have the answer to this question. And honestly, before I put my feet down, there was Adelaide Ironside, the word. And I had not thought about her. I'd stumbled across her, read a wiki page when I was doing my research um, that was 2016 and I'd looked at her in 2009 mm-hmm. so I don't know a very seven years ago or something like that and I just read a wiki page and thought she sounds like a nut like what an interesting person she was a republican she wrote poetry she created her own art she went overseas she did this banner presentation to the mm-hmm. voluntary troops of um, New South Wales what a woman but I'd never thought about her since then and then suddenly when I went back to the wiki page and looked at her and then I looked at the Australian Dictionary of Biography, I thought, she's pretty interesting. So I went and looked at the archive and I thought, yeah, I think I think there's something in there. Yeah. So I pitched a story which came um, to Elizabeth that was very different than the finished product, but it did start with the beginning of the book with her crossing the North Shore uh, to Sydney in in the boat which I know that she did uh, from from archival research yeah yeah I have to say that like I I had not heard of her before um and then I also the whole office as soon as you start to describe it buzzing just every and everyone I've met I've told them about this book they're like who what that's amazing how do we not know about this person you know what you know what a character what how does how does this person not kind of um come up in art history things like that how you know like just characters of Sydney right (laughs) you know in in the historical context so yeah I was fascinated to kind of jump into this book and the book has so much history in it like (laughs) there is because you you were traveling you're you're in Australia for the first kind of half and then the second half you're you're in Europe and you're following there is so much history and so many characters and historical characters that are included throughout the book what was it like researching that because you had I'm did you have some sort of board up with lots of different um, (laughs) like notes all over it how did you how did you get all of these different historical timelines to come together (laughs) yeah it was pretty terrifying I have to say so um fortunately I received an Australian Research Council grant to look at speculative biography and historical method through the case of Adelaide Ironside so that meant that I had the time and the money to do the depth of research that I think her story required to kind of put it in its context and um and really reflect on it so um you know I did follow in her footsteps that's exactly right so I spent a lot of time in Sydney with the Sydney records you know I really immersed myself in her archive and art which is scattered across the world but is specifically really at the Mitchell and um and also at the Society of Australian um, Genealogists um, and that archive is really, it's full of loose ends and dead ends. It looks like an abundance of riches, but the further you go in, it's kind of scattered. So um, the kind of, uh, yeah, so I followed, I, I answer the research question, they talk about the conceptual kind of inspiration, if you like. So um, I did that archival research and then I started sort of, building up and out. One of the interesting things I found in the Mitchell record, in fact, was that um, there were quite a few things that hadn't been recognised as her coming from her. They were ascribed to a Mr Ironside. So that was (laughs) cool. But one of the, there was this big box from someone who was a kind of um, historian biographer in the 1850s and he had written about her famous male contemporaries, Daniel Dennehy, mm-hmm. William B. Daly and people like that who had played a big role in SMSA as well, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but he had tried to do something on Adelaide Ironside. He had all these scribbled notes mm-hmm. and he'd obviously shut the book shut, the box shut and decided it was too hard. And I can understand why because it's really hard to sort of work out what to do with all these loose ends and these voices that sort of say something and you don't really know where or what time. You, you've got no context for a lot of stuff. So my research involved um, intense amounts of contextual research. Every time I read something about a time period, I ended up creating these massive tables 
Uh, and it would have the primary sources at the top of each year that I had got from different places. And then it would go through each month of each year for things that had happened that I thought might be interesting. And I colour coded them according to whether they were political things, because Adelaide was a very political person. So it would not be a stretch to weave a thread of political um, interest through mm -hmm. that. In fact, it would be remiss not to, yeah. you know. Uh, and so I also had to investigate religion because her mother was very religious and that means understanding Presbyterianism in Sydney as well as more generally. Of course, art was a central piece, but understanding everything from the materials that she uses mm. to the subjects and why to the inspirations and how they were changing and they changed so dramatically over this period of time, as yeah. you would know, Victoria, like the, the philosophies, the aesthetics, the way they were being described. So I'm um, trying to get across all of that. Uh, and then there's just the kind of the, the fashion, the food, uh, the newspapers, the people, they're all kind of, you know, flowing in and out, the big backdrop pieces. So Adelaide's life... Um, was one that intersected with John Ruskin, with the Brownings in, in Victorian England and Italy, um, with the Risorgimento in Italy, that is the wars for unification. So I had to get across all of those big kind of backdrop pieces that clearly also influenced her. But I allowed her archive to tell me where the key pieces were. Yeah. And, um, and when I first started writing the book, I wrote it like a well-behaved historian and my editor said, no, nah, it's not working. We can't find Adelaide in this. Yeah. So I put that manuscript down and started again and I let her tell me. Yeah. But there was this moment, you know, this conceptual inspiration moment where I was sitting in the Mitchell looking at all these records and thinking, what on earth am I going to do with this stuff? Like, you know, I really felt like I was going through hell. And as Churchill said, when you're going through hell, keep going. Because I just couldn't find the centre of, of this book. And um, one of the things that really astonished me about her story was the role of spiritualism and mysticism. Mm. So Adelaide was very influenced by German um, transcendentalism, by American romanticism. All these things were shaping her thoughts and led her to eventually start scrying crystal balls and communing with the celestial spheres. And I quote directly from the archive about that there. And so, the, you know, we we tend to stereotype Victorian spiritualism as table wrappers and frauds, et cetera, et cetera. But I think we've forgotten that if you trace it back to its origins in the early 40s, in the 1840s, it's connected with magne magnetism, with hypnotism mm. and with German transcendentalism and um, the work of Emerson and, and other people like that. And they are looking for the universal infinite, you yeah. know, the, uh, the infinite intelligence, they're using these kind of phrases and that was at the heart of the way Adelaide saw the world. So that really fascinated me and when I was sitting in the archive one day, racking my hair, tearing my hair out, um, I realised that one way to get in and through her archive would be to treat it like she treated a crystal ball. So one of the things I'd done was go to the British Library. You know, I looked at over 50 archival holdings across the world. I followed in her footsteps through London. I went to all the places, physical places that she visited, including her apartment in Rome. Anyway, I'm sitting in, in the, uh, I'd done all this reading about how you read crystal balls according to those 19th century <laughs> maps because I wanted to understand what she yeah. was actually doing right and there were really quite important techniques around it so first it had to be done ideally by virgins with pale skin and long dark hair they were considered the purest con conduits it had to be done when the moon was on the on the wax um, and you had to wash your hands and do all these sort of things and then this is the bit that really moved me you had to clear your mind and uh, lean in and contemplate with a kind of freshness of perspective until from your imaginings came voices and images that um, could be suggestive of something. And really that's what I did with Adelaide's archive. I scribed her archive into being until all those voices started to become conversations, until the people that I could kind of see by serious portraits in the ADB yeah. 
started to become people yeah, who were more... alive to you. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And it's at that point that I um I started writing her story in the first person. Oh, that was the, that was the switch. That was the moment that you were able to kind of step into almost like her universe, her... Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it took years of kind of communing, you know, yeah. with her archives and... um before that was possible and I think that's you know there's a sort of quietening of the mind and contemplating in deep contemplation of the words that they use about the scrying of the crystal walls and I just find all that really quite fascinating because really what's going on with that kind of period of spiritualism is that they're trying to empower people's intuition and imagination Mm -hmm. I can think of Mary Wollstonecraft before then talking about how we use the fire of the imagination to bring the cold clay of characters to life. And um, sometimes I think that we've lost those, the important roles of imagination and intuition in how we make sense of the past. And so that was part of what I wanted to do with the book. That's amazing. That sounds (laughs) fantastic. So uh, you said that the SMSA um, uh, is in the book twice. It is in the book twice. I would be fascinated to know. Uh, so I know that Adelaide did exhibit here from a quick look up myself, but oh my gosh, I am ready to dive into this. But um, <laughs> can you tell us tell us more about uh, this time and what your research has found about kind of Adelaide and the SMSA? Yeah, well, um, it was definitely a part of her life. So one of the first presidents was Colonel Barney. And he was a friend and neighbour of hers, and she's connected with him. Um, And, in fact, I believe that he played a role in encouraging her to go to Europe in the first place. But Barney was considered by many to be a bit of an old stick and conservative in the way that he, um, or at least I should rephrase that and say, so I don't offend any uh, (laughs) descendants, that people like that that generation of native-born currency men with whom Adelaide was very close that is Daniel Denner here in mm-hmm. particular, you know, the so-called boy wonder, boy genius, uh, that they considered Colonel Barney and other and his his ilk to be ilk to ilk to have been uh, very conservative in their management of the SMSA. So they wanted to introduce much more radical things, including discussions of female genius. And uh, and I think this is really interesting. You know, one of the things I was trying to do in this book is not just re- represent the women's stories but also represent the men who admired and supported mm. women along the way and Denner he was one of those as was Dr John Dunmore Lang who adored Adelaide Ironside mm. and and often spoke at SMSA um, including one of the the second incident where mm. I um where I have Adelaide present at that one now I should hasten to say that I do not know if she was at the two events that I described. But I know that these two events did happen at SMSA. So because that's speculation, I often, one of my techniques is to weave people into historical events where I think it's plausible or probable that it could have happened. They they would have been the area at the time. These were the sort of social things that people were going to or educational things that people were going to. So uh, with the group of people that that she would have been associating with I'm guessing yeah and that's right and that she did attend events uh and that the way that I described the events are drawn very closely on the newspapers so in a sense I'm using her presence of that to animate a thing that I know is relevant for her so in the first instance it's the case of uh Professor Rennie Mm -hmm. who was a Scotsman who Dr Lang um the Presbyterian firebrand and controversialist who was her closest mentor um he had brought out to Sydney and uh Rennie was on the up and up in the 18 early 1840s he he was making himself as Mr Education you know the great innovation the expert on all things and uh, he gave many you know of his sort of hyper informed not so informed lectures to the, the fortunate grateful people of Sydney including one which was about female improvement so he ran a number of schools in Sydney including um, one which was really um, ran by his daughter and that and we know that Adelaide attended that school and at that school she learned botanic construction among other things so you know it was quite interesting but Rennie had given a talk at the um at the School of Arts about female improvement and 
in the newspapers, there's a letter in response to this from a currency lass where she basically mocks Professor Rennie and says, oh, thank you so much for enlightening our ways. You know, we are so much better now you're here. How could, you know, she basically says, you're God's gift to the universe. Thanks, Mr. Ren Professor Rennie. And she's really kind of, you know, having a go at him. And, um, and so... When I recounted that episode, I put Adelaide and her friend into the story of that event mm -hmm. so that they could then be the author of that particular letter so we could get a sense of what was going on with the way that currency lasses were engaging with the way that they were being educated and the role that they were being prepared for in society. But Professor Rennie's story is better than fiction because uh, he's, let's just say that his great scaling of the heights is followed by a stupendous fall that involves pornographic material and a court case. So we will say no more. Oh, and a Maori um, war axe as well. So we'll say no more about the end of that. They've got to read the book. They've got to read the book if they want to find out. <laughs> but it's definitely worth telling, you know, it's, it's a, it was such a cracking story. And, again, it opened up these little windows into different parts of Victorian colonial society that I think we sometimes forget. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I think that um, from the the way that uh, the book talks about women's education, it's kind of, uh, it kind of brings light on the fact that yes, women were allowed into these spaces, but it was for the idea that they were so, become better companions for their, their husbands. And yeah, so it kind of, it, it gives a lot of context to things that were happening within kind of, uh, women's rights and with the the petition that is mentioned in the book um, you know and things like that it kind of gives a bit of context to how those kind of shifts were made were starting to be made so yeah, yeah. And, and also thanks for saying that Victoria because it also reminds me that the other reason I wanted to put that in there is it explains why Adelaide didn't want to get married yes yeah. because you know there's all these references to her having many excellent offers mm -hmm. that it said she chose to marry Ah, well you know her mother's marriage obviously didn't go so well mm -hmm. and I think that combined with these sort of attempts to um, turn her into to improve her into someone who was fit for marriage probably had some sort of um, effect impact on her one mm -hmm. way or another so the other incidents where um, which is based at the S SMSA is um, when Dr Lang gives one of his talks about trying to create an Australian Republic mm -hmm. uh, and we know that this took place it's all in the newspapers and uh, I wanted to you know Adelaide was a passionate fiery Republican who wrote um, really extraordinary poetry which was published in the newspaper on these themes often referring quite explicitly to Dr Lang so although, again, I don't know if she was at this event, it seems very likely that she could have been. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to bring this scene in to capture a moment where Australia might possibly have become a republic in the late 1840s, early 1850s, um, before the gold rush and the Crimean War just absolutely extinguished those possibilities. I think we've forgotten that there was this luminous moment where there was a gathering of energies around Dr. Lang, who was not only one of the most famous, one of the most famous controversial figures in Australia, but worldwide. Mm. You know, he was kind of like Trump. <laughs> um, but I think with a kinder heart and with no, none of that sexual impropriety and cruelty and dishonesty. Well, yeah, Lang was fast with the truth in different ways, but he was you know, many of his visions about Australia's future as a federated republic, as a, sorry, as a federated nation came into being. So he was a, a great visionary and architect of kind of the future possibilities of Australia. And I wanted to just bring that back to our surface to understand Adelaide's passion for her country, um, her explicit commitment to republicanism, which becomes relevant when she's in Italy as well, where she's there in a republican period. And she's very preoccupied with Garibaldi. He features in her artwork. So in order to kind of understand her artwork, you need to sort of understand what republicanism mean to, meant to her because it meant something quite different than it did to, say, English people at the time. You know, the English didn't have much of an appetite for republicanism at, at all. You know, they had their own foray in that space. So I was trying to give it its kind of specific colonial context and then what it meant for Adelaide 
which as an artist, you know, republicanism means independence. Mm -hmm. So just as she's striving for autonomy and agency, she wants to see her country do so too. Yeah, definitely. Um, And I also think that, you know, from those two... um, two meetings at the SMSA you kind of get these beautiful friendships you know Catherine that she meets at the the first one um and then also uh you know the the support networks that she has in Sydney and you get an idea of the kind of community that she's uh that she that she kind of was within which is something that you've built around her which is just that's it was just really fascinating to see how um you kind of visualized this person who um was basically decided to not go with the norms not to go with what was expected right just to throw out the rule book and decide to do her own thing which you know was fascinating so I, I thought it was brilliant the way you'd built it all up with all the different people around her so yeah Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's thank you, Victoria. That means means a lot to me because I really felt to understand Adelaide, you had to look at her from other people's perspective, as well as understand stand the kind of the fountain within her. Mm. You know, she often uses this language about wild blue electric fires blowing from within. So she, you know, and um, Robert Browning described her wild and enthusiastic way. So we know that she was kind of like a force to be reckoned with, right? Yeah. But um, in order to kind of, that's just not enough in some ways. You need to situate her within a context to see what a what a creature she yeah. must have been to come across. Um, but, you know, and in this, I was really inspired by the novel Jane Eyre, because that was published in um, 1847, which is around exactly the same time that Adelaide is kind of stepping into the world as a young woman. Mm -hmm. And like Jane Eyre, who is described in that wonderful scene with Rochester as plain, small, Mm -hmm. odd and ordinary, I think Adelaide fits into those qualities. And, in fact, like um, Jane Eyre paints ideal works, Mm. And that's how she describes her work. And that's how Adelaide also described her work. They're drawing on the kind of platonic German idea of the ideal. That's what they're inspired about. Jane Eyre was, Rochester often teases her of being part of the green people and the fey folk, et cetera, et cetera. And this is how Izzy, Adelaide, is also thinking of yeah. herself. Like she takes the nickname, she gives herself the name of, she draws it from each initial of her name, Adelaide, Eliza, Scott, Ironside. To call herself Izzy, and Izzy sounds like the icy, which is another word to talk about the fey folk. So when I, you know, getting deeper and deeper into Jane Eyre just made me think one way to write this is like a 19th century novel that resurfaces Izzy, Adelaide Ironside, as a kind of Jane Eyre character, but on her own distinctive journey with all the ferocity and the fierceness that Jane Eyre yeah. also had, right? Yeah. She was no so wallflower, that Jane Eyre. <laughs> no you decided to describe the the, the work that um, Adelaide did Could, would you mind doing a little reading for us um, yeah, yeah, so, I'd love yeah. To. that would be amazing okay. I'm gonna put on my glasses and see what we can come up with okay so I thought um that I might read a little bit from the beginning of the book so this is um I think it is yeah it's chapter chapter three and this chapter is called Bristly, a beginning. Now, at each chapter, it um, starts with a flower, which is one of the wildflowers that she painted. So the way that Adelaide um, first became famous was she painted a folio of Australian wildflowers that won prizes in Sydney and then was sent on to a Paris exhibition where they were highly recommended. And she followed. She and her mother followed afterwards on that exhibition, to, followed and went to um, Paris and then Rome via England. And during that time, Adelaide would often introduce herself as the flower of Australia. And uh, so she's really trading off her flowers, right? But I think these flowers were incredibly important to her. I think that up until this moment, the people who had been painting Australian wildflowers had been doing so for botanic, scientific purposes. But here in the in the wake of the 1851 International Exhibition where paint boxes were available, women started going out and painting wildflowers. But most of the wildflowers that were being painted were in England or Europe, and they were those kind of world hay flowers. But So I think Adelaide can make the claim for one of the first, if not the first, 
Australian born woman to paint Australian wildflowers, not for their scientific purposes, but as acts of, as pieces of art and beauty in their own right. So I wanted to capture, you know, for myself, I grew up going out and looking at wildflowers as a kid. My grandma also taught me to paint wildflowers. And I found it such an intimate way of connecting with nature that I had a feeling that it would be something like that for her, a kind of meditative practice, really. I mean, we all like going out into the bush, you know, it, it grounds us somehow. So I wanted to kind of capture a sense of that. So this is from the third, the, the third chapter, and I'm just going to write the moment where she's returned home from collecting her bristly um, heath and she's about to start painting it. And I know where she was doing this work because I know she had a studio in the attic of Burton Lodge, a place that she lived in on the North Shore. I've been able to get um, the description of that house. <laughs> I know a lot about the house. And I also know the art materials that she used, the colours of the paints, because I did a lot of research in art catalogues at the time. So what I've done is drawn oodles and oodles of research, and then I've made speculations about the experience that she would have had. Had. But I also know she painted this flower from a pamphlet about her folio. So let's start. She's sitting at her desk and she's about to start. That instant upon the threshold of a new creation is one I now consider sacred because it is when the firm facts of a new subject first begin to blend with the mysterious spirit of the infinite. And yet, even as I allow my heart and mind to become receptive to such possibilities, another part of me always remains sharp and alert, carefully making decisions about questions of form and tone and volume. And as my grandmother taught me, I always take great care not to press too heavily upon the page, lest dark marks show through the translucent paint when I add colour. Will you believe me when I tell you that as I put the tip of my pencil to the paper that morning, it felt as if the entire universe was falling to a hush, as if it too was waiting for me to begin. Sensing the magnitude of all that awaited, I took a deep breath before closing my eyes and then trusting my hand to release the essential shape of the specimen upon the page to form a glorious parabola. When I opened my eyes, I was so pleased with what I had produced, I quickly began sketching out the bell-like shapes of the flowers, making sure my composition was harmonious and of equal height and depth. Then came the cylindrical shapes of the twigs as I sought to capture the delicate shifts of texture which each stem, where each stem departed from the branch. There you are, my bristly friend, I whispered about an hour later, when I finally stopped to stretch my arms and consider my work. Speed, not haste, Izzy, I reminded myself before leaning down to the basket and grabbing a wet rag to sling over my neck before the, because the sun was now pouring through the window. After all, I well knew that one careless mistake would be enough to force me out onto another morning exhibition, expedition, and then I would waste not only time and light, but also my precious paper. Within the hour, I had all four flowers upon the page, along with the short pointed leaves, which I had shaped into an irregular star formation that would then allow me to capture the dark green color and sharp yellow tips. Replacing my pencil with the number six sable I always use for the soft washes and two thin tipped ones for the detailed dry brushwork. I rolled up my sleeves and crumbled a little of the cake of dragon's blood paint into a porcelain palette from the, for the branch and stem. After I blended this with burnt sienna and a little water, a rainbow of reds began to materialize upon the page. As these dried, I produced a comparable spectrum of greens before using my thinnest brush to add tiny dashes of Chinese white into the lightest block so I could compare the, I could capture the creaminess of the bud's stem. I was so absorbed in this task, I did not notice Mama slip into the room. But when she leaned over my shoulder, I had to smile, for she gasped in delight at the sight of my four bell-like flowers floating together, as if in a quadrille, their feathery petticoats lifting and turning in a whirl. That's beautiful. Oh, 
I can already imagine it. It's absolutely, <laughs> absolutely uh, glorious. Oh, what a connection, right? What a oh, beautiful. Yes. And that also actually brings in as well Martha, who's a huge, huge part of this story. Tell tell us about yeah. that. I love Martha. I love Martha Rebecca Ironside, formerly, you know, her maiden name was Redmond. She was the um, the daughter of a convict forger and um, a First Fleet Marine who had become the town jailer. And they lived down the lower end of George Street at a place named Redmond's Court. And she married a, um, a Scottish uh, auctioneer and broker called James Ironside. But the marriage finished after the death of um, Isie's younger brother, in the 1830s and so thereafter Martha brought her daughter up and laid up by herself. You really captured that beautiful relationship in that description you know the 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 way they are throughout the story you know that nurture and that Martha shows to Adelaide you know that support that she always has and you almost feel like throughout the book she's a little uncomfortable quite a lot of the time but she's <laughs> Well, that was just so apparent in the archive. It was really very interesting. So, you know, she was, Martha was also a native born currency lass, but she was of a different generation. And I think she was much more socially anxious about um, life. She didn't have Adelaide's confidence and, and you can understand why. But it's interesting. The records show that um, Martha could speak um, French and Italian. And that she was also an accomplished musician who who taught music lessons um, after she left her husband to keep the family afloat. So she had um, many accomplishments which weren't recognised, and she had many more responsibilities. You know, she in in many ways allowed Adelaide to be a freer spirit than she could afford to be. Yeah, absolutely. Quite the entrepreneur, really, when you think about it, and social <laughs> like being able to deal with social situations and things like that. I think that them as Adelaide obviously devoting herself to her artwork and and then her mother really devoting herself to Adelaide really was what it was it's a beauty it's a, throughout the story it's a beautiful relationship and you decide to write it from these two perspectives I thought it was really in interesting where did that when did that start to form Mm. Well, um, and the book is called Wild Love, not only because um, Adelaide uses that phrase in one of her poems, but for me, Wild Love became a way of describing the many things that, the many passions which consumed Adelaide, but also Martha's wild love for her daughter. You know, after Adelaide died, Martha writes and says, you know, I'm returning now to Christ aware that um, I've been distracted all this time with my earthly idol." <laughs> my beloved one referring to Adelaide Ironside so there was a great love there too and um, in Adelaide's very last letter she writes to Dr Lang from Italy and um, and she says you know if I don't make it back to Australia I'm sending all my artworks with my excellent mother who has come with me and sacrificed so much to be with me on this journey and that I just found that so moving, Victoria, because in um, the work that's been done on Adelaide Ironside in the past, there's not much, but, and, and it's, it's wonderful work, you know, including a terrific biography by um, Jill Poulton, um, kind of uh, from the 1980s, but not much attention is given to Martha. And I really felt that she had been, um, that she deserved to come out of the, the shadows and have a voice of her own. And, you know, I will admit also that, putting her voice in allowed for a different generation of currency lasses to have a perspective, but it also meant that there was a point of tension um, between the characters that I thought would be healthy to see certain events and situations from different perspectives because just Adelaide's perspective is pretty out there and Martha is much more cautious. I think she was much more anxious about the convict stain and the impact that it, you know, and also being a single mother. Mm -hmm. um, and she was much more religious, you know, whereas Adelaide proudly described herself as a Christian spiritualist. I think Martha was well and truly in the square of <coughs> being a well-behaved, devout Presbyterian. So I wanted to bring out those sort of things. But, um, you know, Martha's voice just really moved me as well. It was a much more fragile, a much more tenuous voice. And 
ultimately, I just didn't want this to be another biography that was only a hero's journey of Adelaide Ironside because her story, when you look at the archive, is full of all these other women's voices and it tells a heroine's story, which is of many women supporting each other. Um, and that was the nature of what it was like to be a woman in the 19th century. You just didn't go off on your own. You know? So when Adelaide was in um, England and Italy, she became part of a group of people known as the sister painters who had gone to Italy to have greater uh, personal and professional freedom. And female networks were absolutely essential to building your confidence, to creating um, social mobility, to supporting you and she Adelaide had many of them and right at the heart the one person who stayed with her to the very very end was Martha and I guess just to finish off with one last thing is that I was really struck by how um you know we started this conversation by talking about how Adelaide is not well known and I think that is probably because people have tended to be very critical of her art and what I saw in her artwork was a moment where she was just about to change from um, a previous fascination with neoclassicism mm -hmm. to moving more towards the pre-Raphaelite focus on a sort of hyper reality and had she done so her work would have been much more in keeping with the times and more popular and better appreciated today but Adelaide died before she could make that successful transition and so there is a kind of sense of failure in her story of anonymity and failure that she didn't get the recognition she didn't make the changes you know as artists we're always experimenting yeah and failure is intrinsic to the experimental process right and to be cut short in the middle of an experiment that looks like a failure that's tough but yeah. when I was thinking about that I really got thinking I couldn't get away from the parallels I saw between the story of Persephone and Demeter. Mm -hmm. uh, and <laughs> so Persephone in the Greek myth is out collecting wildflowers where the earth opens up and Hades quite literally drags her down into the yeah. underworld. And then Demeter um, stops spring and forces winter across the world, no crops, you know, she's the god of the grain until her daughter comes back, until she's um, reunited with her daughter. And that becomes the cycle of the seasons. And those were very ancient, powerful women's stories from, um, from that period and they've continued. But I think there's a parallel there. You know, um, like Demeter, Martha literally follows her daughter into hell yeah. to try and retrieve her and recover her. But Adelaide has this compulsion to go into these dark places and come out the other side, whether it's her health, whether it's her artistic journey. And the question that stays for me with this is, was Persephone abducted or did she willingly go into that place? And it's worth thinking about that in those ancient trad traditions, Persephone becomes known as the queen of the underworld. and I wanted to just have that resonating through the book because I think as artists, people who want to be original, whatever it is, my own experience of writing the book is that you have to go into the underworld, uh, willingly or not, but you have to reconcile yourself with those dark places, um, yeah, before you can come out and find the spring again. <laughs> Definitely. It's a, a the, the process, isn't it? And to be cut short during that, process of her you know learning and working on her work definitely absolutely so I want to just as a last question to you Kira thank you so much for your time so far why do you think this is so important right now mm. this book for... right. what do you think it is <laughs> oh I think me personally after reading this um I think this is a book for anyone who is deciding to take a leap it's a real inspiration. It's like going into being your true self, going into the unknown, taking a chance. You you read this book and you're just like, wow, what a character to just just not not go with the norm. And it's almost like it wasn't even a consideration to her either. Do you know what I mean? It's just not even a consideration. This is who I am. I want to uh, to focus on my work, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. And obviously. She, the the people that she had around her allowed her to do that but it was that so I I really think at the minute if you're looking for a book that's uh something that if you're about to step into something that you want to do that's new and you're feeling challenged this is a great book but I also 
I also think at the minute there's such a huge movement with uh, trying to give, especially women artists, voices. There's a whole there's a whole movement now. I I feel that has kind of had women. Uh, there was a exhibition just quite recently, uh, Know My Name, Australian Women Artists at the National Gallery. You know, gi giving actually photographs and names and artworks to people who were around. It's a very uh, male dominated art history that we have. So I think it's amazing to hear about people like uh, Adelaide, you know, so very inspiring. That's how, what I think that's at the minute, I think this is an amazing book for those two reasons. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's, that's wonderful. Um, because I guess that was my experience too of writing it. I felt like I was stepping away from being a well-behaved historian and even a well-behaved biographer. Now, I was breaking rules all over the place, but I was following my instinct, my intuition, and um, and if, if, even though that kind of took me into hell in a lot of different play, what, times and places, uh, almost three years, in fact, you know, of the actual writing was was pretty hellish in some ways. But, you know, who are we if we don't have a relationship with our intuition? Mm -hmm. So I feel that so often the way that we write humans' lives, we, um, you know, when we shortchange the past, we shortchange the present and the future. And so there's these fantastic historians in England who call themselves, or across the world actually, and they call themselves the historians of the unknown. And one of their cases is that they've made is that, the way that we've been doing history for a very long time since it sort of entered the academy is to keep ourselves at a great distance from anything to do with emotions or spiritual beliefs or religious principles, that we really look at it through the kind of scientific lens and try to justify our own, you know, try and build our own cred by treating that with a degree of distance, even contempt. Um, and in so doing, we deny the fact that people's lives are animated by what they believe in. They're profoundly shaped by their interior worlds, their intuition, their their imagination, um, by their spiritual experiences, right? You know, Adelaide had spiritual, mystical experiences in her life and they may helped her make decisions that made her the person that she was. But historians and biographers, I think, often ignore that. And... I wanted to put it front and centre because I think it is front and centre of our lives, but we're often not given any platform for talking about it. It's like we have to eschew it, deny it, put it on the distance, and I think it's one of those kind of leftover hangovers of having a very male-centred world that men don't like to talk about this a lot, so women just, you know, behave the same way. It's all We're all very well behaved about it. But when I was reading Adelaide's archive and I heard her talking about the universal intelligence, you know, the infinite power of love and all these things that she's talking about, I was blown away by the fact that this is the language that people kind of still are using in different mm -hmm. ways and that there is a kind of a set of spiritual traditions that inform the way that we connect with nature, the way we make meaning of ourselves, the way we make meaning of our lives. Mm -hmm the way we look after one another or fail to, you know, or the way we look after one another, the way we see the world. And I just wanted to bring that back into the conversation because I think we're, you know, we need deep roots to live in this world. We need roots that tap roots that go down into the water and that kind of those spiritual traditions. And I'm not saying there aren't forwards and fakes and all that sort of stuff, but there are spiritual traditions that we can tap into that have long legacies. And Adelaide's story is a gift that brings those up for consideration, I guess, recovery. Oh, beautifully said. And thank you so much, Kira, for your time talking to us today. Um, it's been an absolute delight and I really appreciate all the time and effort you put into making this book. <laughs> it's been fantastic to hear about it. Um, oh. And yeah, so thank you so much. <laughs> I would like to thank you too, Victoria. That was um, a stunning interview and um, so thoughtful, so connected. No, and what you also reminded me is that those spiritual traditions that I've been talking about, they've also shaped the way we've brought we've created art 
you know yeah. it's an act of a creative process I think think and and you seem to really register in that space you know with your own understanding of creative processes and stuff like that so thank you for meeting me oh. in this project on that level yeah, thank you great thanks yeah what a fascinating conversation with Dr. Kira Lindsay about her new book, Wild Love. So uh, you can buy the book. Uh, I'll put a link in the bio so you can see where you can get the book, hold of the book. Also, the City Mechanics School of Arts in our members library, you can uh, borrow that book as well. Um, if you were super interested in the things that we were talking about today, I'm also going to be putting in a link to Kira's uh, website. And there's also research material on there that you can go and check out. And if you are like me, absolutely fascinated by Adelaide, you can actually go and see one of her paintings on display. If you're in Sydney, you can go to the gallery at the Art Gallery in New South Wales on the ground floor for free. You can go and have a little look. Um, I must have walked into that gallery space so many times and I totally missed it, which I feel awful about. But it's called The Marriage of Kana and Galilee. And you can find it on their website, but you can also go and visit it for free um it, it was a beautiful experience going to see it uh, so and it's surrounded by other artists who have made uh artworks around australian um wildflowers as well or flowers landscapes things like that so it's it's, it's really worth going and checking that out as well so yeah anyway i hope you enjoyed this conversation um and uh have a lovely rest of your day <laughs>